Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's event with John Colapinto presenting his new book, This is the Voice in Conversation with Greg Keston. Uh, tonight's event is part of the Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now everywhere else. So be on the lookout for more virtual science book talk series coming up next month, which will very soon be posted on our website. Uh, for new event postings in the series, you can visit the webpage harvard.com science or sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com. We also have a YouTube page where you can view any previous talks that you might have missed. Tonight's event will conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask our speakers something, please go to the Q&A button on your screen where you can submit a question at any time throughout the talk. We'll get through as many as time allows for. And also a remind, reminder that if you would like closed captions, you can click the live transcript tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I would also like to say a tremendous thank you for your patronage. Your support makes this author series possible and ensures the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you to all of you for tuning in and showing up for our authors, for indie book selling and for science. And finally, as I'm sure you know, with virtual gatherings, uh, technical issues can arise. And if they do, I'm gonna do my best to resolve them quickly. So thanks for your patience and your understanding. And now I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Award-winning journalist and writer, John Colapinto is the author of two novels, the thrillers Undone and About the Author, and two previous works of nonfiction, As Nature Made Him a New York Times bestseller and Becoming a Neurosurgeon. A longtime staff writer for both The New Yorker and Rolling Stone, John's journalism has earned him a National Magazine Award. You can find his stories in several collections of the best American science and nature writing and in the best American crime reporting. He's joined tonight by theoretical physicist, Harvard lecturer, and Harvard Associate Director of Science Education, Greg Keston. Greg helps produce not only this Science Book Talk series, but also incredible educational online content, such as his Nova PBS original video series, What the Physics. This evening, they will both be discussing John's latest work, This is the Voice, all about the human voice, how we speak and listen, exchange information, and the musicality behind all of it. In the New York Times book review, Mary Roach hails the book as exemplary, charging off in surprising and consistently fascinating directions. And the main edge writes, quote, books that accomplish this combination of informative and entertaining are few and far between, but John Colapinto has written one that does exactly that. We're so pleased to have them both here for tonight's event. So without further ado, John, I will turn things over to you. The digital podium is yours. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kate. Uh, and hi, everybody. Uh, you know, maybe the best way to start for me to sort of explain what this book is, is by telling you how it almost didn't come into existence. Um, I had actually written a story in The New Yorker about a vocal surgeon in Boston, a guy named Stephen Zytels. Zytels had saved Adele's career by removing a little polyp from her vocal cord, a little piece of scar tissue. And uh, the story went over well, it was kind of interesting. Um, and I was actually invited uh, to talk about book ideas with the head of Simon & Schuster, Jonathan Karp. And Jonathan said, you know, gee, of, of your stories recently in The New Yorker, I love that one about the vocal surgeon. Is there a way to turn that into a book? And, you know, I, I was a little crestfallen because I thought, yeah, I love that story, but I know it's not a book. And I knew that because I'd done a fair amount of thinking about voice and linguistics, actually for some, from some other stories I'd written. I had done a story about a tribe in the Amazon with a very unusual um, way of speaking that seemed to defy Noam Chomsky's theory of universal grammar. 
And in doing that story, I knew all about how complex this stuff is about making sounds with our voices and converting it into lang into sound. Um, so I, I, you know, when when Jonathan said that, I, I thought, oh, I can't. There is no book. I told him that. I went away and and I couldn't stop thinking about it. One of the reasons I thought there wasn't was just think about how vast the subject is. You know, you, you, you can get into accents, you can get into singing, you can get into uh, vocal dysfunction, you can get, again, into language, you get into how babies learn to speak. I mean, how do you get your hands around a subject this huge? And I will say, actually, that as a journalist up to that point, my strength had been in real sort of storytelling, narrative. I'd written a couple of novels, as Kate mentioned. Uh, the, the book that I, you know, was a bestseller with was called As Nature Made Him. It was about the world's first infant sex reassignment of a child. And it told a very specific narrative tale centered on a family and a physician that had, you know, promoted this sex change back in the 60s. And there was kind of a medical scandal associated with it. What I'm really saying is that it was a narrative arc. There was story and character. Um, and again, that's kind of what I felt I thrived at. With a story like this or a book like this, you're really looking at a subject where there are interesting topics, subtopics that are scattered all over the place. And they range from male and female voices, as I said, race and voice, uh, race and voice. I mean, uh, you know, sort of sexual orientation and voice because, you know, some people detect a gay, I mean, where, and then you get into political voices. And I was beginning this book just as, uh, beginning writing it just as uh, a guy named Donald Trump was, uh, was uh, elected president uh, and he had a very specific voice. Um, so, I mean, these, all of these ideas were banging around in my mind. Somehow or other, I have to say, because I couldn't let it go, I, you know, I would wake up every morning and write notes and I was starting to read books about the subject of the voice. Finally, I just said to my agent, look, you know, I can't give it up, but I can't seem to write a proposal. And she said, well, look, let's just take your story about Dr. Zytel's in The New Yorker, write me, a, write me a page and we'll just like staple them together and send them out to publishers. And um, actually, you know, Simon and Schuster, who had dreamed up the idea initially, uh, they did want it, but another publisher offered more money. So we went with them originally. And then there was a little publishing screw up. It ended up back at Simon and Schuster. And all of this, and I will now wrap this little, little introduction up by saying that I scored a book deal for a very complicated book. And I had no proposal. I had no idea what I was going to write. And I didn't know how I was how I was going to write it. Not an ideal situation. These days, books are sold to publishers with extensive, elaborate proposals, often with chapter breakdowns and sample introductions, and you name it. I was under the gun to produce this thing in a year. It ended up taking three years. I would say that first six months was spent doing what anyone writing a book proposal would do, which is to sign up, kind of calm down and figure out for myself. The key was to figure out a narrative, because again, that's what I love is kind of sequential, chronological, and dramatic storytelling. What I discovered was the sort of narrative to hang this story of the voice on, brace yourself, was um, actually the evolution of the human species and our differentiation from all other animals and mammals in particular, kind of a big subject. Um, so I was, I just kept getting into deeper and deeper water. However, I am glad to say that I somehow managed to write the book. Uh, it somehow got well reviewed, uh, sold a couple of copies and lo and behold, I find myself at the Harvard bookstore, no less talking to all of you about it. So it couldn't have been a complete disaster. Um, no, I mean, in all honesty, I ended up loving this project because it stretched me in ways that I was, you know, that were totally new to me as a writer and storyteller. And it got me into areas of science, each one of which 
was just beyond fascinating. Audio physics, neuroscience, evolutionary biology, sociology, um, developmental uh, psychology in children, the development of children. I mean, it was just absolutely fascinating stuff and just took me into a whole bunch of areas that I absolutely loved. And somehow I did, I think, streamline it into a story that talks about who we are, where we come from, and potentially even where we're going, because I even touch on computer and voices. So I don't, I'm not sure if that was 10 minutes or two hours, because when you're talking like this, anything could happen. But I, but I think I'll wrap it up now and go to Greg. Poor Greg has to somehow weave us through this labyrinth. Greg, good to see you. Oh. Oh, I'm I'm only grateful to uh, to talk to you about this book. So I, I I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed it a lot. Um, I have I have no background in in linguistics or uh, uh, the science uh, surrounding the voice. Um, uh, you know, I, I specialize in physics, but um, but like you um, and you know, you saw that this is something that's hard to stop thinking about. In reading this, I found that I could not stop thinking about it. I was thinking about, you know, the tone in my voice, talking to different colleagues, um, you know, based on ideas in your book, my relationship with my mother and brother um, from ideas in it. Um, I was paying attention to my breath as I spoke. Um, and and I, I realized, you know, um, even when I'm hearing somebody with a different language, I sort of know what's going on. And I, you know, and so I, I started realizing all these things um, just from the, the few days I was reading your book and interacting with the world. So I also could not stop thinking about it. Um, it, it, was, it was great to read. Uh, I, I can recommend it to everyone in the audience um, to check it out. I believe in the chat, you um, there's a link to it. So um, I really do recommend it. Um, but. I think we maybe could start by just asking you to get a little more into um, your adventures with with your voice and uh, and how that how that inspired the the beginning of this. Yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that compelled me to do this was that um, there really was no other book on the human voice. And I, I, I really came to realize why, I, a book like this that sort of gets its arms around the whole thing. And I realized why, it's because we take our voices for granted. You know, uh, as I put at one point, I ended up cutting this out because it seemed like uh, too coy, but you know, it's, it, we, it's right under our noses, but we don't pay attention to it, it's right there. I, however, pay, a, pay attention to my voice for the reason that 20 years ago, I damaged it. And the audience may hear a, a rasp in my voice right now, which may get worse as we go along, we'll see. What I did was I was invited to sing with a, 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 the Rolling Stone in-house rock band. Jan Wenner invited me to sing, You Don't Say No. Um, I'd sung all my life as an amateur, but I had never done proper vocal warm-ups where you kind of limber up the vocal cords, which are these delicate pieces of flesh in our throat. So I actually would get up, I was writing uh, my first book at the time, and I would get up from a day of silence and go to the rehearsal space and just literally start blaring as loud as I could over guitars. Um, needless to say, I started to get raspy. This had happened before, but this did not go away. And um, actually, it was a woman in my building who is a vocal coach who heard me speak in the elevator. It's a building I just moved into back then, still living in it 20 years later. She said, oh, you've got a serious vocal injury. I said, no, no, it, it, this will clear up. And she said, no, 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 I, I coach like Broadway people and actors and you got a serious thing going on. So anyway, I, then I began to realize she was maybe trying to suggest it could even be a, like a malignancy or a tumor. So off I went to the doctor. It takes a lot to get me to the doctor. Off I went to Mount Sinai, just a couple of blocks from where I sit right now. I got scoped and lo and behold, the doctor said, you know, you've got a polyp on your vocal cord. It's, it's a little piece of scar tissue, exactly like actually Adele's. You know, I, he told me that it would take like a, quite an elaborate operation and six weeks of vocal silence. Um, and I couldn't afford that at the time. I, I had just, I think it was when I was about to sign on at the New Yorker and I wanted to be interviewing people and using my voice. So I thought, well, I'll get by with it. But all this is by way of saying, this meant that I knew that my voice was compromised. And actually when I interviewed Dr. Zytels for that later story for the New Yorker, he also said to me, you got a screwed up voice and it's affecting your life in more ways than you realize. 
it's changing. Um, you, you're actually speaking in a more of a monotone than you ordinarily would you, you, because you're trying to sort of find that vibratory part of your vocal cord that puts you into a pitch where you can at least be heard properly, but it's kind of taking out the melody. This ended up being important for ideas in the book, this idea that we ride our voices up and down importantly. But he also said, you know, you know that when you're in a crowded restaurant and you try to speak over everybody else, your voice is going to be bad for like a week afterward because your other vocal cord that your polyp slams against swells up. I said, yep, you're right. And I had always been like a gregarious guy. I mean, I still am, but I kind of realized, yeah, this makes me withdraw. So all of this is by way of saying that it was really Zytel's that said something as tiny as a little lump on your vocal cord and this raspiness can actually affect everything about how you're putting yourself across. And that stayed in my head. So when I was struggling with, you know, do I do a book on this? I thought, okay, there is no, there was one other book, but it was, and it's not a terrible book. It was written over 10 years ago, but it was kind of disorganized. It was all over the place. And I thought, I want to write a streamlined kind of cogent and well-organized book that, that sort of finds a thesis that is new and important. And it really was this evolutionary aspect of our voice, it being the adaptation that took us to the top of the food chain, which maybe we can talk about. But, but in any case, um, yeah, so I had this personal investment that made me think about something that the rest of us are lucky enough to not have to think about. Um, that's great. So um, you, uh, near the beginning, um, talk about the attempt to define voice, um, which turns out to be somewhat difficult. H how would one attempt to, to do that? Well, that's exactly it, because when I would say to people, um, oh, I'm, I'm writing a book about the voice and they go, oh, singing sounds cool. Or they go, ah, accents, no, so, so important. You know, wh whatever they would say, you know, they, everybody had their own particular section of the voice that interested them. So the question became, what even is the voice? Uh, to, to your point, I guess I decided that for the purposes of the discussion I was going to undertake, I wanted to talk about that aspect of the voice because after all, dogs and cats make vocal noises and birds do, so they all have voices. What is it about our voice that's special? So I guess I decided I would take on that aspect of voice that enables us to do this thing that's unique to our species, which is to shape the acoustic signal into language, into this patterned, uh, sort of system of vibratory, you know, acoustic waves that project my thoughts into your head, which is after all, all, all that I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm using the vibration in my throat and then shaping it with my tongue and lips and also using pitch control through tightening and slackening my vocal cords to actually add a layer of partly emotion, but also just stress to talk, you know, I make my voice go higher when I really want to emphasize. So in other words, I'm also using music. So I'm using music, but I'm shaping it into consonants and vowels that um, permit me to take the ideas that are in my head and pass them through this complex system into airwaves, uh, patterned airwaves that go into your acoustic system, which then you can decode into language so that my thoughts appear in your head and then you transfer some thoughts back to me. Um, I mean, it seems, as I say in the book, you know, if we were watching, a, if we were an alien species watching a nature documentary on this about the human species, we would definitely call our spouse into the room to watch with us because we'd say, you would not believe what this species does. It, it's just insane. They're making the air vibrate in ways that they can transmit thought. So that's the answer. That's how I decided I would tackle voice. It's important though, I guess, to, to note that in saying that, you know, there is this layer of the linguistic level, which is incredibly important, but there's also that mammalian legacy of 
of music and speech and growling and mewling and all these other things that are emotional and mating signals that remain as salient in our voices as they are in the rest of the animal kingdom. So I, I also wanted to make sure that was in there. That's great. Um, so let's, let's go to the beginning of life. Um, how do children learn to speak and how do parents and caregivers teach them to speak? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing for over 50 years, it was, it was kind of um, accepted that this language, the ability to speak is, is inborn in us. And even the grammar, the complex grammar of speech is, is already somehow in our heads. Um, and that it's brought to life by interaction with the, with the world, with what we hear. And I think a lot of that is true, but I think, and that was the Chomskyan model of universal grammar. But, you know, increasingly as we, as we look at what babies are, first of all, hearing in the womb, the amount of language and prosody, which is actually the music of speech from the Greek pro towards Saudi song, towards song, we speak towards song. Um, the amount of prosody and, and even probably some words that we're hearing in the final trimester in the womb is actually kind of startling, we've discovered. Um, and one of the things that we're discovering is just how quickly babies learn. I didn't know this 20 years ago when I wrote As Nature Made Him about how we learn our gender or a sense of, of ourselves as male or female. But in doing this book now, I've discovered how there's been this explosion in learning in, in studies of how astonishingly fast we learn. So to your question about how do we learn to speak, you know, we're getting a layer of the emotional movement of sentences in the womb, we're then born. And what we've discovered is that babies actually can hear very subtle differences in what are called phonemes, uh, the individual little sounds of speech, um, in ways that even adults can't. They can tell like click language, clicks and so on, um, or a French t in the word t from a T in, uh, you know, two, the way an English person says it, those are actually different T's, two and two. There's that way that I'm pushing my tongue into the back of my teeth. You know, we, I mean, we may be able to hear, ex, you know, those differences, but there are even subtler differences in, across the 6,000 languages or 7,000 that exist um, that we as adults don't hear anymore. We heard them when we were born. That's the point. And what starts to happen as we listen to our native language spoken around us is we begin to hear our parents use, if we're English speakers, two, two. We hear that T over and over again. A French baby hears the T, T. Here's a different T. And what that starts to do is, is actually sculpt our brains. Um, sounds that we hear over and over actually wire up circuitry to speedily hear those sounds and the sounds we're not hearing as English speakers like that Q sound actually get paired away. Those, those linkages that would, that would make fast connections for those sounds die away and we essentially a sculpt an English language brain. So we are, and we are doing that incredibly fast after birth like that those, those are being reinforced. We're also hearing um, the way vowels, of course, are shaped in the mouth. And, and all of this, we are, um, we are laying down in our brain for when we start to make out words, individual words. Amazingly, how, I mean, how do we really do that? It's not fully known. But one thing I can tell you is that studies show that if you show a picture of a weird object to a baby and say, that's a dax, you just make up a word. You, and you tell them that once. If you test that child, I forget at what, what age this is. It might be like before one year old. When you test them two weeks later and you show them the thing, they know it's a DAX. I mean, if they're, they, they, so in other words, we are speedily learning words. And, you know, we are also learning over time grammar. I mean, we can get into how we're doing that. Chomsky said it was, pre-installed 
because it's so complicated how we insert certain phrases into other phrases and move them around for when we make a question and so on. But Chomsky was considering language as purely a written form. He studied written sentences and all of his acolytes, you know, that study this stuff, we're, we're looking at written sentences, except we don't read as babies. We're hearing spoken language. And those grammatical chunks are actually differentiated by the tune, the melody to which we set our, our voices. So we say, the dog that's sitting over there is eating a bone. So I went, the dog that is sitting over there is eating a bone. So we're actually fitting clauses in with melodic changes. And if you think that's not important, or if you think that's too subtle for a baby to hear, first of all, studies show how unbelievably acute babies hearing is for the most minor changes in pitch. But if you think it's not important to how we speak or learn to speak, let me now just drain my voice of all prosody. And now we just lost a whole bunch of listeners. People just went, nah, because it will drive you crazy listening to that. You will go mad. You know, <clears throat> we are singing to each other as much as we are speaking. So to cut to the chase again of your question, we're hearing little individual elements of speech as babies. We're hearing words, which we're learning super quick and we're distinguishing and hearing those melodies. And we eventually learn how to take all of that stored knowledge from hearing speech. And then we gradually produce it ourselves through things like babbling, which is not just playful noise. We're actually playing with our voices and then we we accidentally hit a speech sound that we've heard our parents say. And we say, two, 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 over and over. A French baby says, two, two, two. But you get my point. And, a, and gradually we, we build up to speaking sentences. Long answer, but there it is. No, that was, that was, that was great. Um, okay, so you mentioned um, prosody. One thing that I found really interesting was you mentioned that the, the, this music of our speech is actually processed differently in the brain, in a different region of the brain. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could give a little more on, on the evidence that that prosody is sort of distinct from language and um, how is it important for conversation? Beautiful. You know, one of the ways so much of scientific understanding of our species comes about through horrible events. And when people have strokes, for instance, in a particular, very particular part of the left side of their brain, um, they lose the ability actually to speak properly. Um, they can still think clearly, they, they know what they want to say, but they can't put it across. And it's a type of stroke where they, they actually spit out little pieces of language or they get words out of order and so on. And that's one of the ways that we learned that language is processed in a part of our, the left part of our, of our brain. But there are strokes actually that occur on the right side of the brain that, that leave in perfectly intact the ability to speak language because those language centers are healthy and normal. But on the right side of the brain, we've had destroyed parts of it that are about the music of speech. Now, how do we know that? Well, the people that are afflicted this way cannot hear the prosody in other people's speech, and they themselves speak in a more monotone way. They're, they're drained of the ability to ride those very important melodic swells and dips and so on that give language its life and so much of its meaning. But yes, it's, it's really through, through strokes is, is one way. Um, there's also been just fascinating uh, study of how, well, maybe I'll leave that part out because it actually gets to another aspect of, of, uh, of how the brain actually works in processing language and emotion. But, but that's, that's what I would say is those strokes is, is how. Yeah. Um, okay, so maybe we can talk a little bit about our evolutionary history and how speech emerged. Because the, the first beings on life, the first living organisms, 
they, they weren't speaking. Um, so, so when did it come to be that things started to, living things started to vocalize? Yeah, I mean, I, I decided to go right back actually to the lungfish, uh, which is this amazing creature, which was the first uh, creature to emerge from the sea onto land. And they still exist today, virtually unchanged. Uh, Darwin, I think, called them living fossils, and he was fascinated by them. Really what they are is they are fish that live in very shallow water environments. So they are sometimes exposed to droughts where they would ordinarily uh, die off because they can't breathe in air. But, you know, through the, one of those happy accidents, a genetic mutation, uh, you know, some number of these fish were, were developed actually lungs from the flotation devices that they use in the water. Um, and they would act, they actually developed a hole at the bottom of their throat, at the bottom of their mouth, that permitted them to drag air in through the hole into those lungs. There was a problem, however, when they went back into the water, they could drown. So they developed a valve. That valve is what our vocal cords are. Our vocal cords are not strings that vibrate like um, a guitar string. They are a valve that opens and closes very, 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 very quickly as we push air through it. Now, so the first, to, to get to your question about the evolution of a voice, you know, creatures that evolved from those original lungfish were things like uh, frogs, amphibians, reptiles, um, all, uh, amphibians first, then reptiles. Um, and they, you know, in, in the kind of beautiful logic of survival and mating, every adaptation that can be made useful continues to be so and, and sort of evolves to become even more so. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, frogs and toads discovered that this vocal valve that they could vibrate by pushing air up from their lungs was super, super useful in pushing away um, threats to their territory. They could make a loud explosive sound, but it was also great for mating. They could make mating sounds that uh, the, uh, you know, females actually, it's the males that do the noise, um, liked. It, it becomes still more refined in the mammalian species. Uh, mole-like creatures that evolved, and then of course things like dogs and cats and so on. Um, you know, you really, if you listen to them, you know, there's there's much more expressiveness going on in your pet dog. Well, you know this if you hear it growl, if you hear it mule because it's sad or hurt. You it, you can hear sounds when they're hungry, of course, when they're threatening another dog and so on. Darwin was fascinated by this. He wrote a whole book about the, the expression of emotion in, in animals. And he made the observation that our speech you know, is continuous with these with these emotional vocal sounds that you know mammals are making. You know, he thought that a species of ape, a more intelligent ape, you know, um, developed the ability to shape those emotional vocal signals in ways that were indicative of um, actual threats or warnings in the environment. I think it was Darwin that suggested that a, 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 a smart ape might have mimicked the sound of a lion in order to warn you know, his, his group that a lion might be nearby. So in other words, you start to get sort of um, willful uh, shaping of the vocal signal. Now, that's not something really that we think our dogs and cats and bears and mice are doing. We tend to think it's more um, intuitive and in the moment that, that, um, that there's not a lot of thought behind it. But I guess my point is that Darwin thought that sort of intelligent apes started to use uh, deliberately thought out reasons or, or, or motivations for shaping the signal. And one of the things that my book looks at is how adaptations and changes to ape vocal tracts led to greater refinement of how we manipulate that vocal signal into the remarkable thing that you and I are doing right now, which is shaping sounds into strings of words with grammar and so on. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's my best attempt. So yeah, you're, you're talking about um, 
the different animals, they all vocalize in different ways. Um, but, you know, say a lizard has a different brain than a human or a primate. Um, and in the book, you describe the three parts of the brain that are layered on top of each other. So I was wondering if you could just describe those, those oh, I love this parts part. and, and how are those involved in speech? Yeah, I, I love this part of it. And, and some, some neuroscientists like to get angry and say, yes, well, the, that's kind of an oversimplification of the brain. Well, fine, but it's, it's an extremely good organizing principle and it is in its broad strokes correct. You know, a, a lizard has a, you know, very primitive brain. He really has only the brain stem, which we also have, which is this part of the brain that really controls breathing. It controls our blinking. It controls all those processes of the body that are completely unconscious, um, but that keep us alive. Um, you know, you, as I point out in the book, it's, it's a part of the brain that again, that we have, because the way evolution works is we kind of layer new things on top of useful old ones. And brain stems are very important. They're just not that interesting. So that if you step on a, oh, actually lizards have no speech at all. This is the thing that blew me away because they just have this brain stem. They actually communicate like the desire for mating by moving their tails. There's tail movements. It's, it's awesome. However, they will make a noise if you stomp on them. Um, it kind of, uh, they, they sort of emit a noise. And so do we with our brain stems. So I guess what I'm getting to is that certain sounds in human beings emerge from different parts of our brain. So if you hit your, your thumb with a hammer, you're going to go, oh, probably. Um, in the act of sex, you may have, you make, make a noise during orgasm, which is kind of emerging from that brain stem area. With the emergence of mammals, actually another layer of the brain starts to grow over it, which was called the limbic system. We call it the limbic system, um, where activity in that part of the brain actually starts to modulate more refined and social aspects of vocal signaling. So lizards are highly unsocial. They eat their own babies. Uh, babies learn to flee to the top of trees to prevent being eaten by mom. Again, not social. Mammals are absolutely sort of defined by their amazing sociality. We, I mean, we see it in our, again in our dogs, not so much our cats, but our dogs. Um, so that the, really what you see, and Darwin talked about this, is kind of this wonderful richness of vocal signaling amongst mammalian species to negotiate um, group activities to, to mate, to, to raise children. It's huge. I mean, mewling sounds that babies make and crying out for mom and dad, like mammals do it. Um, all of this is a refinement of this, this area of the brain, this, the limbic system, again, which we also have in our brains. What we have in a much more developed way than do mammals, although they also have this, is is cortex, which is really what, where we think of thought, reasoning, planning, emerging. And it's that wrinkled layer of the brain that we always see when the you know, skull is opened up. If you open up a cat's skull, they also have a considerable amount of cortex. So no one wants to say, and it's actually an interesting thought as to how much are they thinking? Maybe more than we want to know since we eat a lot of mammals. But in any case, um, really what you're getting in human beings is an a kind of fascinating and incredibly complex interaction of the cortex, the thinking layer, the feeling layer of the limbic system, and the brainstem layer of kind of automatic responses. And in, in speaking to each other, we're getting all of this in play. And because we have such a huge cortex, a large cortex, I mentioned earlier that part of the brain where language is processed, that's a cortical part of the brain. Um, it's really what's allowed us to, to talk to each other and to create social groupings that are so huge. Um, you know, apes can manage about a hundred. I think it's a hundred. Um, you know, we have entire, obviously villages and cities and, and nations. And if we could only get the whole global thing going, I mean, we might be in a safer uh, state than we currently are, but that's, that's what human beings have managed to do largely through 
talking to each other. One thing I found really interesting was you mentioned um, Dawkins and Krebs um, wrote this paper on an arms race with a voice. I was wondering if you could describe that because I think the audience will really find that interesting. I, I mean, I, I love the the uh, the arms race, and 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 I, I, incredibly enough, I'm forgetting. You have to just tip my memory for the details of how that arms race. I'm actually forgetting what the hell they said specifically. Yeah. So so basically, so you you were saying how they there's the mind reading, and then there's deception, and throughout evolution. Oh, I love this. Yeah. I I because I couldn't remember which wrinkle. So one of the things that made me feel like I had to write this book was this whole idea of the, the importance of the emotional part of our speech. All of the stuff that we're sending out there that's not the language layer. An example that I give in my book is when I was trying to hide from my nine-year-old son my terror that the world economy was collapsing in 2009. He came in the door, he couldn't see me, I was around the corner, but you know, I called out to him as I did every day. Hi Johnny, how was school? And I thought, I don't want him to hear how freaked out I am. So I said, hi Johnny, how was school? And, and his response was, what's wrong? So he was hearing in my voice, something that I was trying to hide. Dawkins and Krebs, they were the dudes that did the study on you know, how my son was hearing that, how I was trying to prevent him from hearing it. And really what you get, because they beautifully talk about kind of the deceptive signaling that all animals do at different you know, layers of the, uh, of the animal world. So you get you know, uh, deceptive coloration in butterflies and you get, so we as a species have developed um, deceptive signaling in our voice but what happens is because you know and why would we try to deceive with our voice well to promote our survival and our mating which is really what evolutionary you know advancement comes down to natural selection but our listeners are equally eager to survive and mate so what krebs and dawkins pointed out was an arms race begins between the signaler and the, the person that's receiving the signal, the creature that's receiving the signal. As I get better at deception, the receiver of the signal gets has to get better at detecting the deception. So I've got to get a little better at deceiving and they have to get a little better at detecting and a little better. And what you're really building there is, is this sort of layers of nuance to the way I'm speaking and, and sort of hiding my emotion or, or shading it or shaping it, but then also the auditory detection of what's going on. And this is why, you know, we end up as such an amazingly complex species in, you know, listening to a play, listening to Laurence Olivier, you know, uh, mimic emotion or, or, you know, how and, and why we're such amazing Geiger counters for the most finely tuned emotional signaling. So that's the Dawkins. And I can't believe I blanked on what it was because it's one of my favorite things in the in the whole sort of field of, of voice. No, I, I only gave you a hint of it, but there's so many. I mean, I, I have to say there, there are so many. Um, different pockets of research. There are hundreds of little studies that you mentioned, all connected to the the voice, and it you and you you pack it all in. And you know, I just I find myself just bringing these little nuggets into my life. I'm interacting with a colleague, and I'm oh, the arms race is happening here. Am I being uh, you know, what do they really mean? What do I am I am I being deceptive? And so you know, and and you know, there there were so many of these. Um, one uh, that I was thinking about um, just before this is I was talking to Alexa. I wanted to know if I'm late. So I asked Alexa, what what time is it? Um, and um, you talk about the development of prosody and um, emotional understanding and um, emotional speech in our robo-voiced friends. So um, is, did you get any clues in your research about what we can expect for the future of you know, emotionally expressive AI? Are there, are, are we, are there things to be concerned about? Are there things that we should be excited about? In my opinion, I mean, I guess it depends on 
if you're a pessimist or an optimist about this whole AI thing, I guess I'm a little pessimistic only because they are getting just a little too good. Um, yes, I think the future of, of voice AI, um, we can already see how amazingly good our um, voice detection systems have gotten at sort of taking dictation from us. They're getting surprisingly good. There's fewer and fewer mistakes. Um, they are, I mean, 20 years ago, I guess when Pinker, Stephen Pinker wrote The Language Instinct, you know, he made a lot of sport at, at how bad computers really were at, at figuring out this incredibly complicated thing we do with connecting sounds just across a sentence. Um, and his prediction was that, you know, it would be a very, very long time before that was ironed out. Well, it, it ended up not being a very, very long time. Um, but what the final frontier seemed to be emotional signaling in the voice. Um, you know, how we express, again, you know, the Krebs and Dawkins thing about the, yeah, about how we're, we're creating nuanced speech and hiding it from each other and so on. Um, you know, it was, it was de deemed unlikely that computers would get good at that anytime soon. But I ended up interviewing a, a young guy who for his PhD decided to try to figure that out, the emotional part. And what he dis discovered was that machine learning by simply playing amazing amounts of emotional speech carefully labeled to say, this is anger, this is loving sounds and so on, which isn't easy to do, but they're getting better at that too. Playing that at computers, uh, you know, in huge volumes that computers are getting amazingly good at hearing those things. Um, I mean, his prediction was that our computers would, you know, eventually be able to say, um, you're lying to us, or as my son did, said to me, you know, what's wrong? That we are gonna start saying things to our computers that they detect, you know, an ulterior motive in what we're saying. I mean, if that excites you, that's awesome. Um, makes me a little nervous um, because of the ways that that can be um, perhaps used. I, I don't know, maybe there's only good uses to which that could be put. Um, but I, I, I am very much of the opinion that this will be something that computers will get as good as us at hearing emotion and at producing it when they themselves speak. I mean, we love laughing at how computer speech can sound, but it, it's soon gonna be undifferentiatable if that's a word from actual human speech, I think. I think I'm gonna go to the audience questions. We have a few. Um, so uh, one um, of our anonymous attendees asks, um, did you learn anything in your research about why we enjoy certain vocal qualities um, as opposed to others, um, why we prefer certain singers' voices, for example? You know, this was, this was sort of the final kind of frontier of the book. Because when you ask a question like that, you're asking about something that really is irrational. You're asking something aesthetic some people would say you're asking something almost spiritual because people feel this spiritual lifting with, with a beautiful singing voice. And I didn't want to be a coward and not address it because again, when I would sit down and say, can I write this book? Should I write this book? That was one of the hugely nagging questions. I remember my son was going to a performing arts high school at the time that I was sort of thinking of writing the book. And my wife and I went to a performance and a, and a young high school girl started to sing. And I, she had not released uh, much of a note. I mean, it, it couldn't have been even a second long. And every hair on my body prickled. And I felt the whole audience sort of, I even heard them almost sigh. I then ended up trying to talk to experts about what this is, what, why do certain voices do this to us? I actually ended up speaking to a person, an executive producer on the TV show, The Voice. And she pointed out, I don't watch that show, I have to say, but apparently 
there's moments where the, the judge is listening to blind to voices are, are, are supposed to hit a buzzer when they either, I guess, when they like a voice. And she talked about how they all dive for their buzzers at the same moment when, when and the voice has barely released again, much of a note. And those are the voices that are the most compelling. So what on earth is going on? Um, I think we can only speculate. I mean, um, you, you know, I, I, maybe I'm a bit of a Freudian. You know, I, I almost wonder if I don't, if it doesn't somehow go back to things that we've heard in childhood from our um, mother's voice or from, from frequencies that reach us in the womb uh, when we feel in wombed and safe and secure. I mean, you, you hear how flaky I'm getting precisely because, you know, it, it's kind of the best question and it's, I think it's unanswerable. And as a matter of fact, it, it occurs to me, I ended up speaking with um, a great opera singer who's, because I'm 63, whose name is going to escape me for a second. She lent herself to um, full R Renee Fleming? No, that's not who it was. Maybe it was. Um, she lent herself to full uh, scientific investigation of, of her voice. And, um, and it was interesting because most very famous singers will not do this. Their agents will say to them, it's a waste of time. You're not getting paid. But she was curious enough scientifically curious enough, awesomely, to actually submit to sing, singing while in a big MRI machine and so on. Long story short, they couldn't discover what makes the voice as amazing as it is. I mean, certain brain areas lit up, but they also light up in speech. I mean, this is the most elusive, but most wonderful of, of sort of final, and it's, I save it to the end of the book because I basically want to say, Someone else has got to write the next book because I don't have the answer. Let me let me um, add a little tag to that question, which is, what um, attracts in when it comes to voice one to a potential romantic romantic partner? Wow, that's a huge can of worms. I mean, they say you know studies are showing that uh, you know they 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 have female undergraduates listen to sample voices of men, and they discovered that. Um, Actually, voices in a, in a lower register uh, are the ones that kind of excite the girls, go for the buzzer for that, the young women. Um, why? Well, there are evolutionary possibilities as to why. Um, deep, and, and why would men's voices have got, and, and, and incidentally, I will say, we are the only species, this blew me away, that has a voice as clearly differentiated in pitch from um, between men and women uh, we're like a full octave different. No other species is. I mean, is this not insane? So why on earth did men develop these deep voices? Again, the theory is that females seem to prefer it. Why would they? Well, if you go for this notion that a female is going to want a male that is kind of capable and strong and able to go out there and collect food while she's back at the fire with the, this is not the most feminist part of the speech. Um, but anyway, um, while she's protecting the children that she's raising around the fire, she's going to want someone big and strong. Well, deep voices are actually a kind of, in its own way, kind of a deceptive signal. We can lower our voice in encounters, hostile encounters, in order to sound, Darwin pointed this out, as if we're big, bigger. We actually do this lowering of the voice when we want to command someone because think of it like a you know a violin is small a small resonance chamber a cello is much bigger a bass is still bigger because deep voice deep sounds come out of larger bodies so that's what we do and when we talk to our babies even men do this we raise our voices because we want to sound loving and, and it makes it seem like we're smaller and less threatening so this is a winding answer to your question, but for females, supposedly the lower voice is more interesting, uh, more, more seductive because it suggests this, this mate. For men, supposedly this higher voice actually hints at physiological aspects of the female voice that are um, attractive to us. Um, uh, I mean, again, I mean, all of this stuff sounds sexist as hell, but uh, there it is. Um, you know, a higher voice suggests this, this body that's smaller that we, for some reason, men are more attracted to. 
one of the things that I thought was most interesting about this whole aspect of the female voice is that the men supposedly respond to a slightly, a slight, almost slight sort of whispery rasp in the voice. Think of Marilyn Monroe, who has kind of that whispery sound. And this is, again, supposedly, I keep throwing that in, because actually the female vocal cords do not meet at the very back, the same as, a men's, as men's do. So there's a little bit of a whispery rush of air that is coming out in the female signal. Supposedly this has gotten wound into the male DNA. We, we hear it if we happen to be heterosexual and are attracted to females. And so this is, we're hearing some, some whisperiness, a slightly a higher pitch. Take this as you will. Uh, it may all be correct, it may not, who knows. Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to say before we only have uh, about another minute or two, um, but there are just a number of topics that we didn't get to hit on, which are in the book that are incredibly interesting. Um, you talk about how our brain reacts differently um, when we hear somebody who has an accent that's different, that's an out, that's considered an outsider, um, which I, I thought was incredibly interesting. Um, you talk about how this relates to politics throughout history. Um, you talk about how the written word is related to speech. And so I just, since we didn't get a touch on all of these, I, I wanted to just, just mention a couple. And I wanted to ask you if there are a few, if there's just a, a last nugget or two um, from the book that you want to throw out there. Yeah, I think, you know, I have to say, I love the accent stuff because, you know, that limbic layer of the brain, which is that emotional layer of the brain. I mentioned that we as human beings have all these layers, brainstem, emotional limbic system and cortex operating kind of simultaneously, but but not quite simultaneously. So that the signal that comes in, the, the, the vocal signal is actually processed, you know, milliseconds earlier in the limbic system before it's passed up to that part, that rational part of the brain. And the theory is that we're actually responding to accents with our with a quick limbic reaction, which says to us, if we're hearing an accent foreign to our own, oh, this person's different than me. This, is, this might be a hostile encounter. Um, and it might go back to our evolutionary history when we needed to figure out if someone was friend or foe according to lots of different things visually, but also um, the sound and maybe principally the sound. So I, I love that aspect of it. Um, because it also hints at what, it also kind of speaks to what makes us special as human beings, which is that we do have this rational layer of our brain as well, where if we have an immediate sort of threat response to a voice, well, to, to an accent, well, we're also not apes. We, we, we have this rational part of our brain, which then says, oh, no, 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 let me let me listen to what this person's saying. And even if it's in a different accent from mine, and even if the, a person does something as subtle as transpose an S and K in the word ask, so that they say ax, um, or if they use a feature of, of uh, black vernacular, uh, black speech, or as black English as people now call it, um, that this doesn't have to be a reason for forming some prejudicial reaction to the person that we're talking to. Uh, or if the person happens to speak in a Southern accent and we happen to be Northerners, we don't have to make a huge set of assumptions about that person politically and so on. We're bound to do so incidentally, and the book looks at that. The book looks at the fact that accents develop not because um, we, that we sort of drift into dif different accents. We're, we're kind of pushing ourselves apart around political things. And I mention this now just because our audience and, and you, uh, Greg, may have noticed that we're at a time in history where there's a fair amount of kind of political divisiveness. There's a little bit of emotional reaction going on on Twitter. Um, you know, we, we, we seem to be tearing ourselves apart um, a little bit. Um, and, I, and I hope my book is a little bit of an appeal as well uh, as talking about those aspects of voice that do kind of pull us apart. Ultimately, voices are, we're, we're privileged as a species to possess a faculty that has allowed us to collaborate and cooperate in a global way because of this amazing thing we do. And I, I just say, let's, please let's rely on that as opposed to um, what could ultimately emerge, which is very, very bad. 
Did that make any sense? Anyway, I think uh, no, and I, and the the insights in your book, I really think you know bring everyone together. Uh, you know, uh, are a lot of different voices and and uh, show us how we can look at them and and how we all we all evolve the same the same sort of uh, mechanism and emotions in our voice. And um, it was uh, an enjoyable read and uh, an enjoyable conversation. Thank you. I'm so glad. This was really fun. I really enjoyed it. Hello, I'm back. Thank you both so much. Um, I'll add to the thank yous for this fascinating talk and Q&A. Greg, your questions brought this to such interesting topics within the book, so thank you. And John, I was like literally on the edge of my seat throughout your talk, and I Thanks. love that you added that there are still some unknowns out there for the next book someday. So thank you both. Um, everyone out there, thank you so much for watching this evening. Um, supporting the series. If you want to learn more, copies of This is the Voice are for sale on harvard.com via those links that I put in the chat. Um, so on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science and the Harvard Library, have a great evening, keep reading, and please be well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.